Hello, I'm going to be talking about this book, Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achib. Here's a brief summary. It is set in the 1890s in Nigeria. It circulates around the life of this guy called Okonkwo. His father Onoka was a lazy man and lay around playing the flute the whole day. So Okonkwo had a drive to succeed because he didn't want to be a coward and an embarrassment like his father. Okonkwo, trying to pursue his madness, became the greatest wrestler in Umoja, the village he lives in. He also has three wives, Ezinma, Ojugu, and Noe's mother. Apparently she has no other name. The whole village population is addicted to this food called yams. And Okonkwo also happens to be a great farmer of the crop. With his three wives, he has three children. Ezinma, Obagaili, and Zabak Noe. Noe's mother obviously having to have some god Noe. Yeah. So Okonkwo is this fearsome warrior who has killed like... Six people, uh, the last of which was his adopted son Ikemefuna. His death was demanded by the oracle, this ultimate god that everyone believes in. Then the daughter Azimma gets a fever, which she shouldn't have gotten because of the sacred stone, the Iiua, that was buried for her and the ten previously lost pregnancies by her mother Nikwe. But life went on, however, and the Congo's friend Odirika invited him and his family to the wedding of his daughter. It was a great celebration where they drank pots of this beverage that everyone is addicted to, called palm oil. And apart from the delicious dishes, fish and stews, they have pots of yams as well. Okirika also has a son which won a wrestling contest in his teens. And Lakonko wishes he had a son like that because he thinks his actual son Noi is turning soft. So mosquito! And wants to do something about it. So yeah, that's pretty much what happens in the whole book. It's just about Okonko and his mild problems and the things he does in life. No. He killed the oldest clan member's son on the oldest clan member's funeral. And is exiled for seven years. That's funny, seven kills, seven years. He sent to his motherland, Banta. How ironic, right? He was always trying to be all manly, and then he sent to his mother. During that time, a lot of white guys come and killed dozens of people. They were Christian missionaries, and their leader was Mr. Brown. They built a church in the evil forest, where a man should not be able to survive longer than two or three days. But the whites are unstoppable. gathers followers from the mafia to pray every seven days and makes them think there's only one god instead of their six evil ones. And guess who decided to join their prayers? Mosquito! Soon there was a government established and schools were open. Nwoye was also renamed to Isaac. No, no joke. You can imagine how much Okonko facepalmed when he returned to mafia after the seven years. So much that he killed a missionary as the man entered the village market one day. Of course, nobody was on Okonko's side. So he gave him cola nuts. Nah, he hung himself. I chose to read this novel, Things Fall Apart, because I didn't know a lot about Nigerian history or culture. Actually nothing. The aim of this video is to tell you about what I have learned. More exactly, what are the similarities between the novel's characters and I, and who are the haves and have-nots in this relationship? What do children in Nigeria have that I don't, and vice versa? So let's start with a comparison of the characters and I. Okonko's father, Konoka, was extremely lazy, and during the wet season, he would always put off plants in the yam scene. The only thing he was really good at was playing the flute. He even had his own band that children loved to listen to. This was at the beginning of the novel, and it reminded me a bit of myself. Instead of planting yams, I often procrastinate in doing my homework. What I do instead is compose music and make simple songs. Instead of the flute, I play the saxophone and piano. Instruments are a key element of my life. Without music, the world would be a boring place. I don't understand why Okonko doesn't play any musical instruments. Sure, the equi drum is mentioned during wrestling contests and weddings, but drums can never give the same beautiful melodies as saxophone and the piano. Oh, sorry, sorry, I forgot. Okonko's a great wrestler and uh, yeah, really manly. But he always strives to be the best that he can be, which I do too, even though I end up tapping on the keys of my computer. Yeah. I always try to get good grades in school and even push myself to a physical extent. P.E. Or in fifth grade when I punched this guy in the stomach so he couldn't breathe. But that was a long time ago, I was short tempered like Okonko. Love is the answer. Anyway, Okonko's only expectation was for his sons to be tough and that his wives were in the kitchen or more like a campfire. Speaking of food, I'm very fond of cooking myself. In the novel, for special occasions, fish soup is prepared and the colon is shared. Rhymes. My father grew up by the coast, so every summer we'd go to our summer house there and eat wonderful fish called the same day. As for the colonuts, not so much. 
Another similarity, though, is the telling of stories. When Azidma had the fever, or Iba, her mother Akwebi told her the story about the skinny turtoise that named itself All of You. The turtoise went to a bird colony and was a great orator, so was able to persuade the birds to take him with them as they flew to heaven. When they reached heaven, the gods prepared a meal for All of You, meaning the skinny turtoise ate everything and became really fat. Lack of balls. In the book, there are also tons of funny sayings. If I hold the ant, she says, don't touch. If I hold her foot, she say, don't touch. But when I hold her waist beat, she pretend not to know. In my mother tongue Polish, there are so many sayings that it drives me nuts. So we can see that there are many similarities between the novel's characters and I, despite the time gap of 120 years and the very different culture. And the similarities and differences are already an example of the haves and have-nots between us. The present, of course, is a result of the past, and Nigeria's past has greatly shaped the way it is today. Switzerland's history has also shaped its present. Here's a brief summary of Nigeria first. It all started with just tribes and the native people, like the Nok people who made terracotta art and built canoes. But then the Portuguese settled there in 1472. And from there it was basically slaves, slaves, and more slavery. There was a triangular trade where Europeans sent manufactured goods to Africa, Africa sent slaves to North America, and North America sent raw materials back to Europe. The Nigerians never had many rights. The first novel by a Nigerian was written in 1789, due to the lack of education as well, and the first official doctor was qualified in 1875. Then, in 1884, the Treaty of Berlin unified 10,000 African states into just two countries. Britain later colonized Nigeria in 1903 and ruled an indirect rule. The Igbo soldiers fought the British soldiers using guerrilla warfare and hundreds of unnecessary lives were lost. However, the first step of unification took place in 1906, when the Northern Protectorate and the Southern Lagos colony were merged. Then in 1960, Nigeria finally became independent and became a member of the United Nations. The oil boom in 1970 helped the country's trade, and all of these centuries of struggle were finally rewarded in 1994, the year Nigeria won the World Cup. Now for Switzerland's history. A few speed bumps with the Habsburg Empire in the 1300s, and a little war for their government independence in 1798. But apart from that... In the present day, due to the struggles that Nigeria had, there is an enormous disparity among the country itself. But an example of a wealthier lifestyle would be a girl named Amini Mwachopo. She lives in Nigeria's biggest city, Lagos, and is able to attend school. Harmony has English, math, science, and music lessons, where the class sings in a choir and plays the drums. She also has a computer at home. It is still a huge privilege for her to take the school bus because it has air conditioning. Food is also not in any way a hobby like in more developed countries where they make TV shows on it, like cupcake or like seriously. Harmony has the same food at school as her parents prepare at home. This being a vegetable called plantain, a hard but boiled sweet banana-like thing. Then she does her homework, like I do. I guess both of us are stuck with that half. But then she does bead work, which is a bit different from my routine. But I suppose it's better for her eyesight. Harmony's lifestyle is only an accurate representation for 5% of the entire Nigerian population. Some schoolgirls are being kidnapped by terrorist groups, such as the Boko Haram. 59 have gone missing just this February. Good thing we have the benefit of living in Switzerland. The Human Development Index has NA written for Nigeria's education inequality. Interesting. Other data states that 31% of Nigeria's population lives in poverty. This means they cannot go to school, have no fresh drinking water nor electricity, unlike Harmony Matupu. This contributes to the very low life expectancy of 52 years. As for the under 5 mortality rate, the data is not applicable. But health expenditures, though, are not applicable. But income per capita, as of 2005, is... But there is one thing that the vast majority of the population does share, and this is unapplicable. And this is religion. Religion is something that brings society closer and allows people to find meaning in their actions. It is something that the people in Nigeria have that many of us do not. Whether you are fortunate enough to go to school like Harmony Nwachupo or just a homeless fellow, Muslim prayers always take place in the morning, midday and evening for most of the native population. Religion has been a reason for conflict in the past centuries though, so not having a strict religion may be a positive half after all. 
Either way, when comparing Nigeria's standard of living to Switzerland, it is clear that we are the more privileged ones in this relationship. Some facts coming your way. Switzerland ranks 11th in the HDI index, while Nigeria is 153rd. Switzerland has an average annual income of $40,527 per capita. 100% of the population has fresh drinking water. 99% can read and write. Life expectancy is 82.39 years. Not to mention the infant mortality rate, which is only 3.73 deaths per 1,000 births. And the GDP is $371.2 billion. No wonder so many people want to immigrate here. Well, it seems as though Swiss people do have more of a house than Nigeria. It is also safer, and disease is nowhere near as common. However, the culture in Nigeria is something that is going to stick around for a long time, and is something that people can cherish. Culture and tradition is so truly individual in Nigeria that it makes the country a very unique place. Activities from Okonkwo's time are still practiced today, like a traditional wedding. And this is something that Switzerland lacks. The majority of the Swiss population are young people.